Kevin? What up, man? How you doing? What's up? How are you? Uh, I'm awesome. I'm awesome. I'm out hey. of here. And, uh, thanks for thanks for pulling over safely to the side of the road so we can uh, complete this brain chat. Yes, we, safety first. <laughs> um, everybody, this is Kevin Ballister. If you haven't heard of him, he is the man. He is the author of Feed a Brain. He has an amazing story and um, just an amazing personality, and he's doing some amazing things in the TBI community. So let's give it up for Kevin Ballister. Well, thank you, sir. Everyone's clapping. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they are. But what's up, man? Hey, um, Silent claps. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, we did a brain chat a while ago. Yes, one of the first, like yeah. two years ago. Yeah, yeah, it's still really awesome. Good, man. But you've been so busy, I haven't been able to get you back on. It's true. Uh, you could have. You just had to like ask really nicely. <laughs> well, yeah. for everyone that's new to following our page, could you tell them a little bit about you and your history and yeah. and all the things? So okay, all the things. So. Short version, I sustained a severe traumatic brain injury in 2011. While I was in a coma, my mom was told that I had less than a 10% chance of ever regaining consciousness. And even if I did wake up, she was told I'd likely remain in a persistent vegetative state. So I'm very lucky to be here. I didn't eat, walk, or talk for months. My left hand was totally flexed inward. I was breathing through a tube, I was receiving nutrition through a tube, and a lot went into my recovery. At one point, I was steered towards a nutritional protocol, a more specific nutritional protocol. Um, and for all you who, uh, who know of Apex, it was an Apex uh, leaky gut protocol, it was that. And I started to regain some clarity, and I was like, whoa. There's something to nutrition, right? And I'm like, who who would have thought? Like, it wasn't on my radar before, but it was it was then. And I was like, okay, like, something to nutrition. Around what year after your TBI was this? It was it was the it was pretty much the one year mark afterward. Yeah. And it was like I I started to regain some clarity and I'm like uh, you know what? Let me back up a bit, actually. So while I was, you know, in the hospital, I was breathing through tubes, I was eating through tubes, my left hand was flexed inward. Um, let's, let's talk about hospital nutrition for a second. Because we all know hospital food is gross, right? Like, <laughs> oh, hospital food, it's gross, ha ha. And it's like, you no, know, this is what we're feeding people. We're trying to get well. And I mean, doctors learn about metabolism. They, they learn how important it is, how we derive energy from our food um, and, and our vitamins and nutrients and all this. And yet what we feed people, what, well, what our metabolic medicine is in this country is, is terrible, right? We all know this, it's a joke. It's a joke. We laugh about it. But that's the standard of care, right? Now, let's look at... The, I was unable to eat conventionally. So I was receiving nutrition through a gastric feed. Can you imagine what the processed liquid formula is that's being fed to patients who are unable to eat conventionally, what that consists of? Can you, for people that don't know, can you tell people a little bit about it? Glucose syrup, soy protein isolate, corn maltodextrin, milk protein concentrate, canola oil, breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, for months or years for some patients. I have clients, when they start working with me, they have a loved one who's receiving this five times a day. That's the standard of care in medicine. Yeah. And it's like, now, the standard of care, 
is uh, actually the standard of care was coined for medical malpractice cases. And it requires that a defendant deviated from the applicable standard of care. So then if we define the standard of care for a medical malpractice case, it is the type and I'm quoting this, the type and level of care an ordinary prudent healthcare professional with the same level of training and experience would provide under similar circumstances in the same community. Same, ordinary, similar, same. So if, if you or your loved one was given a 10% chance of recovery like I was, how would you like an ordinary practitioner to give you the same treatment that gets the same or similar results? Yet the deal is, if they deviate from the ordinary same or similar standard, they're liable to be sued for medical malpractice. So we all see how this puts a stalemate on the evolution of medicine, right? So I work with clients who often have a loved one going through something similar to what I went through. In fact, what I'm doing in Oregon right now is I'm working with a client, like I, I partner with my clients to bring about the best outcome that we can. So I'm, I, I bring my experience, my knowledge and my connections because like I've experienced a lot of, of this. I have been working within the medical, um, the, I, I don't want to say dysfunctional, uh, let's let's say the the medical model that could use improvement. Um, <laughs> That's me optimistic. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> wait, wait, time out before yeah, you right. go, before you go into how you know how you're working with clients and your expertise. Can you talk a little bit about um, why you were encouraged or felt encouraged to write that amazing book that you wrote? Oh, thank you, man. Because because when I read it. If I didn't know who wrote it, I would have thought that a doctor had written it because it's just, there's so much stuff in there. Uh, and the way that you were able to relay the information and make it applicable was, I thought, amazing. But can you talk a little bit about your book? Seriously. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So I, I, as I was going through recovery, as nutrition made a difference, it was like, whoa, all right. Um, nutrition makes a difference. First of all, like what happened? So I'm going through emails, text messages, um, trying to figure out what happened because I'd been in a fog, right? For a long time. And you don't know you're in a brain fog when you're in a brain fog because you're in a brain fog. <laughs> it's like, it's like being in a stinky room. You don't know until you leave. It's like, how can you tell it's raining when you're underwater, you know? And so as I came out of the fog, it was like, okay, um, what happened? And then, and then also why nutrition and what else could I do to give my brain the best shot? So I'm, I'm relearning how to walk at the time, but we have the internet. So I started listening to podcasts, watching videos, reading articles. I learned how to read peer reviewed research I started reaching out to practitioners all over, telling them a bit about my story. And, and many of them were extremely gracious to help me and to help me to understand, answer my questions. And like, I really, I really learned so much. On top of that, I learned of online courses. So I started taking online courses from from awesome universities like University of California, Cal Poly Tech, Johns Hopkins, the University of Chicago, Duke University. And I was, I was basically piecing together, I was cherry picking courses, piecing together my own major. I need to understand how the brain works, how the brain learns, how the brain's fueled, so that I could give my brain the best shot. I was studying like my life depended on it because it did. And this is pretty common for people who've been in a debilitating condition. The thing about brain injury is you need your brain in order to research. And when you're, you're trying to fix the organ that's going to give you, that's going to 
help you problem solve how to fix the the you know your brain it's a little tricky <laughs> and, I'll, and i love that word tricky it's tricky it's tricky to rock a rhyme you know <laughs> so i mean uh, as as I recovered, I, I, I'm going through all this. And I basically, I then started writing. And, um, and the book you're talking about is kind of like the, my buddy's in gra grad school and he was like, dude, you're like writing your dissertation. This is awesome. Yeah. And yeah, kind of, this is the, the nutritional tools. This is the, the, the culmination um, and, and boiling it down into understandable terms, um, of the, of what I learned to give my brain the best shot nutritionally. Cause as I said, a lot went into my recovery, mm -hmm. but nutritionally that, that was the building blocks. That's, that's what we need first. I think we need to make sure we're supplying this stuff for the brain. So an analogy I, I, I use, I say, many connections in my brain have been damaged. And I think of rebuilding those connections or really building any connections, like building a bridge. So what do you need for a bridge? You need supplies and you need skilled workers. Supplies would be the nutrition, the brain building nutrition and skilled workers would be the therapy, the targeted therapy, the right kind of therapy. Additionally, we need to get the supplies to the construction site. So that's digestion. We need our digestion functioning well so that we're actually extracting the nutrients and shuttling them to the brain. So, yeah, what, what the nutrition is, that's the piece that, that I need to learn. I need to figure out because that was patient empowerment. That was that was empowering myself. Yeah. What, what you put in your mouth, you're the only one who decides that, you know? So, all right, I'm going to choose to eat for optimal brain function because when the brain's functioning optimally, it's repairing itself optimally. I love this about like what we are, this human vessel, this life form. Like when we're giving our our hardware, the supplies it needs, it's like pre-programmed to just to fix things, to make things work the way they're supposed to. And that, I wrote the book, How to Feed a Brain, Nutrition for Optimal Brain Function and Repair. And thank you for saying what you did about the usability because I wrote it to be the resource I wish I had throughout my recovery. Which is why a lot of a lot of doctors like yourself are like, are like the the they just give it to their patients and they're yeah. like, go for it. yeah. I I bought it. I gave it away. I ordered it on Amazon for TBI patients. I just send it to their house because it's it's just a great resource and people don't know that. So so yeah. So that's. That's the book. Um, can you talk just a little bit about other things that played a role outside of nutrition? Because I know that you've yeah. done lots of different therapies. Some of the ones that you found to be beneficial for you. Yeah, man. And like, like, like we said with the bridge analogy, supplies is, this, is the nutrition. Skilled workers is the therapy. The skilled workers, that's understanding the neuro pathways that's understanding how we can affect neuroplastic change and like and coach our client to do the exercises um that need to be done in order to encourage the neuroplastic change to happen um so the point is, like if we do all the therapies it's it's awesome except if we nothing that's going to help. It's like having all the skilled workers in the world and then pulling up with a truck load of toothpicks and expecting them to build something. Right. Conversely, if we eat all the right stuff, but we don't do the therapy, it's like having the best materials to build a bridge and then nobody who knew what they were doing to build it. It's like having a bunch of lawyers trying to build a bridge, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> 
<laughs> so the therapies that really did something for him, first of all, functional neurology was was amazing. I couldn't I couldn't believe how <coughs> sorry. So I couldn't believe how how much um how much could be done through through visual stimuli, uh, vibration plates, functional movements, um, vestibular uh, stimulation, like all of it was awesome. And then meeting Dr. Carrick and and Dati Skrazian and um, and so many doctors. You, uh, Dr. Um, well, where I am right now, I'm at Dr. Glenn Zielinski's. Uh, yeah. I'm actually right outside. So like, can I use a room? He's like, we're closing. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do it in my room. <laughs> I'm using his Wi-Fi, though. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> so I'm, like, I'm stealing your Wi-Fi. So, um, so yeah, uh, meeting all these fabulous, brilliant practitioners, my... My functional neurologist was Dr. Thomas Culleton, who's, who's awesome. And I mean, functional neurology, the other aspect is neurooptometry. Mm -hmm. And that's a piece that's, that's very much missing from the conventional um, treatment of brain injury. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm working to bring that into the, the main what's the word the 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 standard of care the yeah, yeah this the standard of care for brain injury making um, it more optimal and less same <laughs> there you go less same more optimal and, and you worked yeah. with doctor did you work with dr shidlovsky in texas for that? i i didn't work with him throughout my recovery but yes i'm i'm uh i'm friends with dr shidlovsky and i have worked with him since um, Dr. Debbie Zelensky, so I'm at, I'm at Glenn Zelensky's, uh, but Dr. Deborah Zelensky, um, she's in Chicago and no, no relation. Um, and she's phenomenal. Like I, I, um, have diplopia, so I see double with, without my glasses with them. I see double when I look like when I gaze to the left, um, but what working with her so she has me use two different sets of glasses and um i switch them out every every day and my like i used to have serious like uh fatigue after a while just existing in the world and since working with her like my fatigue is like way better and uh, yeah and so check her out. She has the Mind Eye Institute. And I want, I want people trained in what she does because it's phenomenal. It's so good. We, we can add a link in the talk um, for cool. her site. Cool, yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, other therapies like, you know, physical therapy, occupational therapy, all of that was extremely useful, especially – regaining my abilities at the beginning right um and the thing about the conventional medical model we're amazing at saving lives when it comes to saving lives if i'm if i'm gonna get hit by a bus i want it to happen in america because we're awesome and making sure you're gonna live once once stable once uh, well yeah here Saving lives, totally. Restoring health, not so much. So and this is where the next level is. So when saving lives and then bringing you to the point where you can perform your activities of daily living and whatnot, you know, that's, that's all well and good. Um, and then it's like, okay, you can, you can perform your ADLs. You're good. It's like, uh, no, I, my, my brain used to function way better. And I have veterans that, that tell me this. They're like literally told there's nothing more they can do. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, man, nothing more you can do. 
I fought for this country. Like, aren't you going to help me, like, be okay? Nothing more we can do. And this is where going to the next step. So functional neurology, absolutely. Neurooptometry, absolutely. Um, and then also, actually, the cheapest, most effective therapy I, I did for my brain after my injury was yoga. Yes. Yoga was huge. And then I went from yoga to jujitsu, which was really awesome. And that was Dr. Culleton suggested that. And it's such a good suggestion because the proprioception you get from 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 jujitsu or wrestling or whatever you want to do, like, and especially because my balance uh, was severely affected. And like I used to do um, martial arts before my injury. I was, uh, I, 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 I practiced American freestyle Taekwondo. And Weren't you in the third Karate Kid movie too? <laughs> <laughs> you know it, man. <laughs> uh, I was also in uh, in Hook. Nice. Me, me and Rufio, we we had a little fight scene. <laughs> No, no I'm sorry. Oh, good. Oh, good. So yeah, so I I did that, but then getting into, I mean, I used to throw spin kicks and stuff, and like that wasn't happening anymore. But jujitsu, man, was amazing. So these are these are honestly therapies that aren't considered therapies, and you need to be at a certain level to be exploring those. But that's like. You know, physical, occupational got me to one point. Uh, uh, functional neurology and neurooptometry got me to another point. And then yoga got me to another point. And then jujitsu got me to where I'm at now. Okay. I'm a little disappointed, though. You forgot to mention the flipping. Oh, and flip. <laughs> Yeah, and so nice, nice. I, so, I, I, watch so, your, I watch your Facebook feeds or whatever you post. <laughs> so also when it comes to um, simulating uh, the vestibular system, I was, I was told to do rotations, right? So I was doing aquatic therapy as well as I was recovering. And aquatic, that's where I relearned how to run was in was in the pool uh, because my balance was off. But if I fell in the pool, I wouldn't crack my head open, you know? Right. So it was a much safer place to uh, to relearn things. Um, and Dr. Colleton was like, yo, man, you should do some flips in the pool. <laughs> you think you do that? And I'm like, I'll try. And so I, I started doing front flips and back flips in the pool, like, like underwater, you know? Yeah. And um, then fast forward several years and I started doing flips off of a diving board. Yeah. And so that's what I do. Like actually for the, uh, uh, when I give a presentation, I show like when I took my first steps, I'm like, this is a huge deal. I didn't, I didn't walked I, without a walker. With the, like, I didn't got, I didn't even sat up for a long time. Mm -hmm. Then I was in a wheelchair. Then I had a walker, and I, I would uh, sometimes I would use the walker. And then I took my first steps without the walker, and that was a huge deal. And so I showed that video. I'm like that this is about seven and a half years ago. And this was for my seven year anniversary. I celebrated like this. And I show this video where I like I do a front flip and then I do a back flip and I walk over to the camera or, or whatever, the phone, and I pick it up and I go, Yeah. <laughs> and then that's 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 how I celebrate. That's how I, you know, do some things for my vestibular system. I love it. Yeah, I love seeing the flip videos. Nice. Um, nice. Yeah, so I, 
th thanks so much for also kind of mentioning for people the graded types of like exercises and where they got you to where you are today. Totally, man. Um, so t tell us what you're up to, dude. All right. All right. Well, wait, you also have a you also have a great podcast on your website. I do. Yeah, I have a podcast. Yeah. You know, yes, I have a podcast, it's the Adventures in Brain Injury podcast. I love it. I get to interview awesome people doing really cool stuff. Um, and I, I, yeah, I get to interview all sorts of people doing just amazing work. And, uh, you know, functional neurologists, neurooptometrists, survivors, uh, MDs um dc's uh 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 nds and naturopaths and i actually i don't know if you knew this but last year i i spoke for bastier university naturopathic school i did maybe i knew that i can't remember yeah, yeah. it was awesome man i love speaking for schools because that's the future of medicine yeah. and actually this is a good segue because the future of medicine and, you know, as a, it's been my mission to improve neurorehabilitation since, what, 2013, I think I wrote in my blog that, that that's my mission. And so that's what I've been working towards. And, you know, clearly I think nutrition matters, which is why I wrote a book on brain nutrition. And neurorehabilitation almost always starts in the hospital. But what are we feeding people in the hospital? We talked about that. What are we feeding people through a gastric feed? That's atrocious. So if I'm gonna improve neurorehabilitation, and like I said, the building blocks is nutrition, that's where we start, then we need to revolutionize hospital nutrition. So I'm scratching my head, I'm like, how are we gonna do that? And I realize, <laughs> that it's not uh, that that hospital nutrition is just a symptom of this medical model not dysfunctional this medical model that could use a whole lot of work right so what's perpetuating this this model that's that's you know I, i'm i'm going to call it dysfunctional in many ways it's dysfunctional medical model and what's what's perpetuating it now i'm thinking about it and there's so many answers to this question but i'm like i think the biggest deal is that we're asleep to it you know i have i've people tell me we have the best medical system in the world and i'm like let's go on wikipedia and let's type in World Health Organization rankings of healthcare by country. And the World Health Organization ranks us number one in expenditure. We spend the most money out of any of them. Yet we are 72nd in health outcomes. Wow. Woo. There's a discrepancy so, there. <laughs> yeah, it's not very efficient, is it? So, and we still have people like, you know, thinking that we, we have a great system on buy-in, I pay my social security, I do whatever, and like, they, they, and we live in a democracy where, where the awareness and not even just because we're in a democracy, but just like the global awareness of things shifts things. And so if we can bring awareness about this medical model to people, to physicians and to patients, and we can get people to wake up and heal. And so my next, my next company is called Woke Medicine. Ooh. Because, so so this came to me like, eh, I guess a month ago. And I, I like came out of a meditation. I'm like, woke medicine. So I bought wokemedicine.com, wokemed.org, wokemedinfo.com, wokemed.org. I just started buying domains. All the dots. 
I got I got most of the social medias for it, and I'm like, yeah, because the bottom line is, I I know a lot of practitioners. I know so many practitioners, MDs, NDs, DCs, DAN, CNB. I don't even remember what the entire group is. <laughs> Whatever. I, we even talk about it like spaghetti after the uh, after the name, right? And like spaghetti that you work very hard for that spaghetti. But the bottom line is, I don't care what letters are after your name, unless you're woke. And that's where woke medicine comes in. It's like, let's be aware. And it, there's different levels of wokeness or whatever. It's, kind, it, it's about recognizing that there is, that, that it's about recognizing that things aren't good. Things could use a lot of improvement. And being open to learn more and more about what this system is and how it's affecting people's lives. I, I, I work with clients who have a loved one in these positions um, and going through it and I, I work with the medical team and it's, it's awesome. Like how, how much I'm able to influence change on an individual level, like, the the success in you know i told you about the standard of care mm -hmm. and I, i'm gonna give you guys something that's going to change lives right now all right you ready for this Brilliant. so the standard of care again it's the uh it's the type and level of care an ordinary prudent healthcare professional with the same level of training and experience would provide under similar circumstances in the same community and if they deviate from that, they're liable to be sued. Yet, I work with my clients and I coach them to speak with their medical team and every single one of them successfully speaks to their medical team to implement practices outside of the standard of care. For example, I talked about the nutrition. When I start working with them, they're receiving that shit five times a day that changes immediately. We change that reality. And then the next, next move is, is supplementation and start implementing supplementation. So how do I get this to work every time? And when I, when I present this, uh, I'll be in front of a, a, a group and I'll be like, you guys want to know how? They'll be like, yeah, how? You want to know how I get around the same ordinary, similar standard? Yes, how do we do it? I'm like, don't ask. They're like, no, no, really, how? <laughs> I'm like, honestly, don't ask. If you ask a practitioner if you can do a practice outside of the standard of care and they're liable to be sued if they deviate from the standard of care, what do you think the answer is going to be? And then if you ask them what they think about a practice outside of the standard of care, and they're liable to be sued if they deviate from the standard of care, you're likely going to get a recommendation for the standard of care. So don't ask. There's something called the tenets of medical ethics, ethical principles in medicine. And the very first principle is patient autonomy. The patient has the right to refuse and to choose their treatment. So do them a favor. Don't ask. Tell them what treatment you choose. The only question you ask is how can we make that happen? This works every time. And if, if, if the physician's like, nope, don't feel comfortable doing that. Mm -mm, not doing it. Be like, cool. Please refer me to somebody who will give me the treatment I choose. And a lot of times they'll be like, you're going to do this anyways, aren't you? <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right. All right. We're just going to make sure it's safe or whatever. And, and they'll, start, they'll start doing this. And this is one aspect where we can take our power, our autonomy, our 
we become empowered. And that's, that's the tagline. Empowering patients and practitioners to wake up and heal. Because the fact is, practitioners, patients can set the practitioners free from the shackles of this medical system in, in so many ways and vice versa. So if you're a practitioner and you get asked to do something that's not the standard of care, you know, your answer would usually be no. Do this. Be like, are you asking, are you specifically requesting that treatment? Because when you do that, then your liability is off. You're no longer liable when they say, yes, I am specifically requesting that treatment. Cool. Now they've chosen their treatment and now it is ethically your responsibility to give them the treatment they choose or help them to get the treatment they choose. So this is about being empowered. And what I'm building is right right now I'm just I, I'm I'm building a Facebook group and kind of like a brain chat kind of thing, building a Facebook group and interviewing woke practitioners, woke patients, and just woke people, you know, that that have things to say about this this how we're going to improve medicine for our generation and definitely for our next one. Wow. Dude, I love it, man. Seriously. This is this is this is what's on my mind, man. Working with people being in the medical system and just seeing this this it's 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 rough, you know? Like MDs work so hard to learn what they learned, to get those two letters after their name. And then it's like, with many, when you start questioning that, they're like, they're like, you know, they defend it so much. And it's understandable. It's like a psychological, um, there's probably, there's a psychological term for it. I don't know what it is yet. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. But essentially, you you defend what you work for, right? Even if it's wrong, even if it's like really harming people, there the, there becomes this built-in ego about it because you've done so much work to make something happen, mm-hmm. and it's like, how dare you question that, you know? And so it's not it's not about like being combative with with the practitioner by the way let me back up on what i was saying about about like implementing something other than the standard of care when you're like this is the treatment i choose number one you do so in a way where where you're building rapport and it's in a cooperative manner not like you do the treatment i choose because i'm autonomous and you're dark whatever yeah. Like, no, that doesn't work. We need to cooperate. If we're going to change things, woke practitioners and woke patients need to work together. Well, I forgot what I was talking about before. <laughs> <laughs> You're kind of going down the road of like why docs feel a little vindicated. And, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. So it's understandable. It's totally understandable. And this is why we build this bridge. And we build it from this place where it's like, you know, look, I'm just trying, I'm, I'm, I'm like, all right, here. So I was in the ER the other day for a client. Um, she had a really nasty UTI that we saw on Monday. And then by Wednesday uh, was not doing well. Um, and, and we weren't even sure exactly what it was, but like, uh, I don't know how graphic I can get, but whatever. Yeah, you, you're all doctors. You're good. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, there was sediment in the urine, and it was like, all right, you know, we, and plus she was extremely anxious, and 
we took her to the ER and you know there was definitely protein in her urine she had a bladder infection her blood glucose was was super high was like in the 200s and and she was basically fasting like she ate salmon and avocado that day and that's it and her blood sugar was super high and you know the doctor that we were in a critical care we're in the er right critical care and they they ran a cmp and a cbc and all the uh, all all those markers came and showed low protein in the blood high protein in the urine and it was like and the 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 critical care doc came in and he was like so her kidneys are fine and i'm not worried about her her, her glucose she's fine um and i'm like cool like the first thing i said was like yo man i respect critical doctors so much like you guys save lives you guys are so good at what you do and i just want to let you know i respect that um you know i i i i actually said you know have you have you ever heard the mcrit podcast because mm-hmm. so mcrit emergency critical care there's a podcast that uh is hosted by dr scott weingart and he was my critical care doctor Cool. I the only reason I know this is because I went through my medical records, which most people don't do, and I found out who saved my life because he saved my life, and um, and I was like, you ever heard that podcast? He's like, I love that podcast. Like, it's the only podcast I listen to. I'm like, Scott D. Weingart was my 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 doctor who saved my life. Told him a bit about my story. And it was like, he was like, and I was like, look, you know, the, the kidneys, I want to make sure that everything's working out. I want to get to the bottom of the, of the glucose. Like, so can we run an A1C and can we, um, can, and can you refer me to, uh, a nephrologist so we can take a look at her kidney function and stuff and working busy working with there yeah right right yeah yeah well all right let's let's finish this up no tell finish the story yeah let's fit uh, of course <laughs> so so i'm uh, i'm telling I, i'm like can we can we run these tests and he's like, yeah, you know, like, I'm not going to fight you too much about running these tests. Let's run this one. Let's run this one. Cool. But what was interesting is he's like, it's not a big deal. And of course, he says it's not a big deal. He's in critical care. Like, she's not going to die on his table. So she's fine. Right. But again... Saving people's lives, we are fantastic. Restoring health, we can do better. Right. And that's where coming together, practitioners, patients, cooperating, and waking up. Love it. So did did you guys find anything on her labs that... We haven't seen them yet. Okay, cool. Yeah. Dude. Great chat, man. Um, I know you have a dinner to get to because you're like a celebrity now. But you, you had to do this in your car because you have to just shut it off and roll out. <laughs> but I can't thank you enough uh, for your time, man. And seriously, like, I'm, I'm super pumped to see what, you, what, what you're doing with um, Woke. Woke, Woke, Med. Woke Medicine. Woke Medicine. Um, first time I've heard about it. And uh, first time you're hearing about it on Brain Chat, but make sure you follow this guy. He's doing amazing work, and he's got a beautiful, beautiful brain. So thank you, brother. Yeah, you can find me uh, at Feed a Brain on all the social media. Um, the Adventures in Brain Injury podcast. I highly recommend you guys check it out. Yeah. And if uh, 
and get in touch with me. Like, reach out. I love getting in touch with practitioners. Um, and patients, too. There's patients you're doing good watching. work, talk to me. Yeah, we have, we have patients watching, too. So Yeah, I am. Members. Totally. We'll post all of Kevin's information in here. Um, and then you're also speaking at IAFNR this year. Whoa, yeah. Whoa. So Super excited about that. Nice. We'll see, we'll see you in Vegas. And uh, everyone tuning in, thanks so much for watching.